So I kind of want to tie in some of these ideas now into, well, if all things are impermanent and all things are interdependent, what does that mean? And so we're going to kind of discuss that now. The idea of acceptance, non-duality, non-attachment. And maybe we can kind of apply that a little bit more to just what does that look like in day-to-day living? Um, Do you have any questions so far about anything that we've talked about? Okay, then we'll jump into this and see how it goes. Um, I can't remember how many slides or what's coming next. (laughs) So I know I was going to do a meditation, but we're going to skip that for now. So we're going to jump into the, the topic now of the nature of reality. So trying to understand interdependence and impermanence the goal of, of, of that is that that's the way we see reality. Remember I mentioned seeing with eyes of wisdom is an expression in Buddhism. The eyes of wisdom are the two eyes of interdependence and impermanence. So the nature of reality is that uh, reality is all things are interdependent and impermanent. That's like, that's it. So if you wanted to get to the, the core of, of the Buddhist worldview, this is it. It's that all things are impermanent and all things are interdependent, and that's it. There's, no, there's nothing beyond that. So the way this is represented, at least the way I represent this, is right here in this concept of, this is the Zen circle. And I like to use this to convey, this is reality, this is what is. You draw a little circle and this represents what is. Now. I talked a little bit earlier about, um, for us, there's the thing and then there's the nothing, right? So if you were to take this and look at this circle, this can be two things, right? This can be a circle on a white background, but what else could it be? What if the black was the background, then what is this? A donut? (laughs) It could be a zoomed in picture of the donut. Yeah, and that's the donut hole. You can't see the whole donut. Couldn't it be that? Could it be a tunnel? Maybe that's the end of the tunnel. A what? A button. Yeah, it can be a lot of things. Um, They like to do exercises like this where the goal is to get you to see something differently. View it outside of the normal way of viewing it. So you would look at something like this and then they'll have you, you know, tell me all the other things that it is. And that's just a, uh, it's a form of exercising our perspective. Like, well, if it's not this, what could it be? Because in life, we go through life doing, this is what it is. Whatever it is, as soon as we attach to that, if you saw the faces first, it's a face, you know. And if you saw the vase first, it's a vase. So the depiction of reality with a circle is that inside of there's what is and then there's the story we create about what is Um, and we're really good at this so let's take an example of something that happened Uh, I I use the example of the of the car you get you're driving and a car cuts you off what is what is reality there What what is it that happened a car cut you off right Now that's not good enough, so what do we do? We immediately construct a story around what is. And what what is this? What are some examples of that story now? Driver's on his phone. Yeah, driver's distracted on his phone. Texting. Must be texting. He's impatient. Must be impatient. He's a jerk. Distracted. (laughs) Distracted. Yeah. Yeah, we t- why, why do we come up with all the negative ones? What else could it be? <laughs> he wants to hit you. <laughs> oh, maybe he's on his, the way to the hospital. on his way to the hospital. So there could be positive ones. We don't think that way, huh? Yeah. So here's what's important in this lesson. What is reality? There's what is and there's the story of what is. But what is our reality? It's both of them, right? 
Yeah, our reality, in a way, is the story we build. And th this is where it gets tricky. We cannot escape our stories. It's what we do. We, we make meaning. But what we can do is pause and question our meaning, the meaning that we assign to things. Remember the, the Zen expression of great, uh, great doubt, great awakening. Great, uh, little doubt, little awakening. No doubt, no awakening. Apply that logic to a scenario like this. Someone cuts you off, and I immediately think this guy's a jerk. And if, if I have the attitude of, uh, of doubt, and I think, I might be wrong. Maybe he's a jerk, but I might be wrong. The more I'm willing to question that, the more uh, I could be awake or enlightened, so to speak, when I realize, oh, that's what happened? It's like, oh, because, I, because there was room for that to be the reality. If you don't have room for reality to be whatever it could be, it can only be what you think it is. And then, and then we're caught where it can only be this, right? So that's where the great doubt comes into play here. Now, what do you think is in the space between what is and our story about what is? Time? Time? No. Well, I guess. Our experiences? Our experiences? Yeah, I remember at the very beginning, I said the secret to Buddhism, well, I didn't, Thich Nhat Hanh said the secret to Buddhism is to what? Do you remember? It has to do with our concepts and ideas. The secret to Buddhism is to, um, to be able to see past our concepts and our ideas. So what we have in here are concepts, ideas, and beliefs. That includes experiences, past interactions, memories, whatever it is. But how do my, let's take a, an idea, concept, or belief that gets me from here to here. You know, what if I have the belief that um, uh, female drivers are bad? And that's a belief that I have. Now I get cut off by a lady driving. What's, what do you think that story is going to be? Probably going to be she's a bad driver, right? Do you see how my belief created my story? And immediately that's now my reality, and yet that's, it's, I'm already removed from what is. So what are some other scenarios that pop up in life where we construct a story around reality? Can you think of any other examples? If you read the headline, you never read the story. Yeah? Well, news is a good one. Let's imagine a news story. And the news story is, uh, I don't know, something happens in some part of the world. And there's what is, but what are we immediately going to do shaped by our, be our beliefs? Depends what happened, who did it, right? And all, those, all of those things, our concepts and beliefs are going to influence the story we're going to create really quickly. Uh, let's take this at a more local level, a very personal level. You, are, you have a good friend, and you send them a text message, and they didn't reply right away. Or they are replying, and then halfway through the conversation, they quit replying. What is it? What is? They just didn't reply. Now, what kind of stories can we build around that? Oh, I said it wrong. They didn't get what I said, now they're angry. Yeah? It's been in an accident. They're at the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. That was my grandma's response. When they're driving and they can't text back. Yeah. Yeah, so we create a story, right? Now, what, how would our beliefs, concepts, and ideas affect that story? What if you're talking to someone? This is probably a lot more applicable when you were dating. And... Um, I don't know if, if texting was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Not in our day. <laughs> it, was, it was when I was still. There you read into it a lot more, right? Uh, let, okay, let's just think of a whole different example. Um, okay, you're at work. You have a coworker. Okay, this is something that just happened to me. Um, this is, so imagine you're talking to someone, and the vibe that you're getting from them seems like, this person isn't too friendly. They don't want to chat with me. And then they leave. And 
and you're offended because you're thinking, well, I thought we were kind of friends and they didn't really want to talk to me. So what, let's deconstruct that. What, what is it that happened? They were in a hurry from the very beginning because they had something else to do. Okay, well, that's the story. We're going back to the just what is. What is it that happened? They weren't talking to you. Yeah, they weren't, they weren't talking to you. Okay, now beliefs, concepts, and ideas are going to influence the story. Let's invent a story real quick. Why, why did that happen? Their mom just died. Okay. Yeah? Been, and they were in a certain space. And just, yeah. Just yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I like that one. Because they don't want to talk to me because I have bad breath. <laughs> okay, that, we do that all the time. And, and it may not be breath, but it may be they don't like me because, and then you have some story about you. That is, that's a really, really common one. So in this specific case, what happened to me is the person I was talking to was the one who was like, well, this guy's being a jerk and he doesn't want to talk to me. And, and, and then later he told me that. He said, I, I felt like I thought we were friends and you didn't really want to talk to me and I was trying to make chit chat and you were acting like you're too important to keep talking to me, and you left. This was at a workshop in Phoenix. Well, guess what happened? So he had this whole story, right? But guess what actually happened? He had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> no, he knows my twin brother. Oh my God. He knows my twin brother. I've never met the guy. So we're sitting there talking, and he's trying to make chit chat, and I'm like thinking, am I supposed to know him? And, and I'm thinking through it, thinking, huh, I don't know what to make of this. And then I was like, well, I, sorry, I've got to go. Because I, di I didn't know. I didn't know anything about it. And then later in, in discussion with him, we figured it out. And he's like, wait a second, you're not Nick? And I was like, no, I'm Noah, I'm his twin brother. <laughs> he's like, oh, I thought you were just being rude or weird. Or... And I was like, I thought you were a little strange too. <laughs> and it changed everything. And then we were friends again. Well, yeah, he was friends with his longtime friend. <laughs> and it was just this interesting experience, but it reminded me of this, because how quickly were we jumping from here to here? And here's the, the crazy thing is it doesn't stop here, does it? Then we make a story about the story and a story about the story of the story, and that goes on and on and on. And here I was talking to this guy who had a story that was, at least for, for an hour or so, was causing him suffering. And he was probably thinking to himself, what did I do to offend Nick? Why does he not like me? Or he had a story about me. I'm a jerk. Um, uh, but neither one of those was true. It was something entirely different. And luckily we figured that out. That could have just ended and that was the end of that. And there'd be someone out in the world who thinks I'm a jerk and I can't do anything about it. But Nick was a jerk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he would have, yeah, that's okay. No. <laughs> But see how, I mean, that's one tiny example. Imagine all the interactions that happen all day with all the people that we know, the people that we barely know, and we're creating stories all the time. We're always creating stories. And what, what contemplative practice like mindfulness is inviting us to do, it's to pause and question the reality that you construct. Because it's saying, hey, you create a reality, but somewhere inside of that reality is actual reality. And for the most part, you'll never get to it because you can't. All I know is that I created a story and somewhere inside of that is reality, but I may, I may never get to it. And this is why we, we say the, developing the uh, not knowing. You know, I don't know. So-and-so is a jerk. I don't know. Maybe he is. Maybe he's not. You know, that's, that would be the right attitude to take because we don't know the whole story. Okay, this is just something I was thinking. When we have feelings, do they cause us to create stories? So I get my feelings hurt, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to you know, create a story about these feelings. Um, so it's not the feelings that cause you to develop the story. It's the beliefs you have that cause you to feel the feelings. So that's where you pause and you examine, what beliefs am I holding that cause me to feel this way? Somebody doesn't talk to you at work. It's not that they're just not talking to you. That wouldn't offend anyone. But there's a belief somewhere in there that's causing the feeling. It may be a feeling of, I'm not likable. People don't like me. And now I'm hurt that you didn't talk to me. 
And it has nothing to do with the fact that you didn't talk to me. It has everything to do with the belief that I hold that I'm not a likable person. And now we're experiencing self-inflicted suffering. It's, it's all based on a perspective that we hold that's a story. It could be true. It could not be true. And that's why one of the most common answers you'll get from a Buddhist when you're talking about concepts like this is, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And it's not a, a lackadaisical approach to life. It's not, and I, I've alluded to this many times, it's not that you go through life just wish-washy, like, oh, whatever. You can still go about your life doing the things that you do, having passions, having goals, doing whatever it is that you do, but you're, you do it with a lighter grip. You're not, because you, you approach all of it knowing this is the world I live in. And that's different from this one. But I, see, I cannot escape my ideas, my concepts, and my beliefs. You can't, right? You can, because even if I decide, well, I don't have any beliefs. Well, there you go. There's your belief. Your belief is that you don't have beliefs. And now you're in the story again. You can't escape it. You can change them. Yeah, you can change them. You can, they can fluctuate and there's movement because that's the nature of change. But what we can't do is eradicate them completely. We just can't. can't. Can we, as we become more aware of all the things we're unaware of, as we open and are, are more willing to, to accept the fact that we, that we don't know the story? Yes, so accepting the fact that we can't know the story, I think that's the key. That's what we're accepting. So when we talk about acceptance, there's nothing mystical or magical about it. It's that I'm, sec I'm accepting that I just can't know. I, I become content and comfortable with uncertainty because uncertainty is the nature of reality. It's continual change. And the moment I think I figured it out, I didn't because it's changed on me. So what I do is I, I let go of it. Not let go in the sense of I, I'm not connected to it anymore because you can't. But I let go of my attachment to it has to be this or it has to be that it has to be right or it has to be you can just kind of ease off a bit and what you'll find that you know someone who's practiced contemplative practice or you know like a, a, a typical like the Dalai Lama I, I promise you there's nothing you can say to him that's going to offend him he's not going to be mad because he's like what am I mad about and, and who are you to think that like what could you say that would make me mad what part of me is there to even be mad and it's that, I think, is the sense of enlightenment that we talk about with, when the Buddha says, I am awake. I think that's what he awoke to, is being awake to the fact that, oh, well, this is all just a big game. I'm just here. And there's nothing that you can say to me that's really going to offend me, because why would anything offend me? And that's, you see that lightness and that, uh, I guess lightness is the right word, but you see people like that, and they go through life, and they're always smiling and there's, there's a sense of joy, and it comes because there's a detachment from it all. There's, there, they don't, Alan Watts says, like, you don't have to take life seriously anymore. That's the, that's the key. You, you reach this point where you just don't take it seriously because you realize it was a game. It's been a game all along. And you were in the hamster wheel running thinking you're going to beat the game, but you don't. And that's the sense of detachment. So... The key to living mindfully is to remove all ideas, concepts, and beliefs so that the truth is the only thing left for us to see. Remember, we're going back to the story here. And inside of the story, or inside of reality, is the story of reality. And in between the two, we have this our concepts, ideas, and beliefs. And this is the paradox of it is that when you remove all ideas, concepts, and beliefs so that the truth is the only thing left to see, what you're going to find is that there are ideas, concepts, and beliefs there. It's just layer upon layer. It's like deciding, I'm going to peel an onion, and I'm going to keep peeling it till I can see what's in the middle. Well, what's in the middle of an onion? There's, there's not a pit, right? You'll peel it, peel it, peel it, until there's just nothing left to peel. All it was was layers. And, and that's kind of what happens with us. We have our ideas and our concepts and our beliefs, and they're layered. And one idea leads to another idea, which leads to another, and this belief leads to this belief, and they're just layered. So you start removing the layers, and you think, okay, I'm going to remove all the layers. 
Well, now you're caught once again in, in another hamster wheel. That's the, in Buddhism, we call this attachment to non-attachment. That's like the final step of the, pro, of the whole process is that you realize, okay, I'm learning all this stuff. This is great. Now I'm committed to not attach to anything. That's it. I'm, not, I'm no longer attached. Well, good. Now you're attached to non-attachment. And you're back where you started in a whole different place. And you're trying to get rid of something that you can't get rid of. So what do we do with that? Well, first we just understand what that means is we make our own prisons. It's our, our only limitations on the reality, we, the, the story we construct around reality, we lock ourselves in. You know, I like to think about this, you know, uh, my wife and I were talking about this the other day and she was asking me, what do I think about like, like w w morals or things, uh, things of that nature? And I, we were watching a skit that um, Trevor Noah, who's the comedian on the ten Daily Show. Yeah, The Daily Show, was doing this funny bit about colonization. And you should Google it. It's pretty funny. But he's kind of saying, like, we had it fine. And then you guys came and you're like, hey, you need this. We're like, we don't want that. Well, you need it. Well, you need it or we'll kill you. Okay, well, I guess we need it. And then you take it. And, and that's how ideas spread. You know, and I was telling my wife, like, whose idea was it the first time to go to the, uh, an indigenous group and be like, well, you need to cover up because you're naked. And they're like, oh, we're naked? Okay, well, I guess that means we should cover up. And now it's a problem because we just made it a problem. Same with swearing. You know, bad words are bad because we decided they're bad. Oh, well, now I can't say it because it's a conceptual truth now, right? Society decides that shouldn't be said. Okay, well, now I can't say it. So we're doing this. We're creating our own prisons. Now, I'm not saying this saying that we should all go around not, not wearing clothes and swearing. That's not what I'm saying. But I think there's power in understanding that we construct our own rules. Some of them we construct, others we inherit. I mentioned before, language is a perfect example of a social construct that we inherit. I can't, uh, so when we talk about freedom, I'm free to communicate within the rules and regulations of the language that I use. So am I free? Well, not really, because now I'm bound by the rules of language that we all adhere to. I can't just start saying, la la blah, la 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 la, and expect that you're gonna go get me another bottle of water. Well, it wouldn't, because <laughs> it doesn't work that way, right? So these rules that we inherit from our society, from the time in which we live, from the, uh, the, the religious views of where we live, like we inherit all these things and they present themselves in the form of the story. There's reality and then there's the story. So that's why we can't escape that story. Because it's not just our stories of what my coworker thinks of me. Society is caught up in that same story. There's a story of a story of a story and you don't escape it. So non-attachment applied to that just means I recognize that's the nature of it. I play within the rules of the game because that's the game that's presented to me. That's the set of cards I have. I can't just, now, now there's some, there's ability to go in and make some changes with it. We talked about Martin Luther King as an example. There's, there's the societal norm and he came in and, and his actions led to a change. And we see that happening all the time. But none of that's happening outside of acceptance. It's happening because of acceptance. And it helps. You can enjoy the game when you understand that it's just a game. When you understand the rules of the game, the game is a lot more enjoyable. We go through the game not even knowing it's a game, so of course it's frustrating because we don't even know what's happening. <laughs> Imagine trying to play Monopoly with someone, and they, but they don't know it's a game. And they're going to be furious when you put a hotel and they're like, what? No. <laughs> like, hey, it's a game. <laughs> And I think that kind of happens in life. All right, one more quote. The greatest thing you'll ever get is that there's nothing to get. The secret to life is that there is no secret to life. People don't like hearing that sometimes. Like, well, of course there's something to get. You watch me, I'll get it. It's like, okay, go. <laughs> Good luck. And when you get it, tell me. Um, yeah. I think what Buddhism is trying to teach through all of its tools, meditation as a tool, mindfulness as a tool, is this, is that there's nothing to get. We're playing a game called life and 
and the whole meaning of life is to just live. That, that is the point. Now, how many of you uh, decided, okay, I'm ready, to, I'm ready to exist, and boom, you existed? It doesn't happen that way, right? So we talked about causes, causes and conditions. Our very existence is the result of causes and conditions, actions that took place that caused you to suddenly exist. Now, so you're not immune from that process of causes and conditions, but neither, are, uh, neither, neither is anything. If you experience an emotion like happiness, what are the causes and conditions? You can look at it. You can, you can actually pause and look and realize, oh, I'm happy because of this, or I'm, I'm sad because of that, because all things have their causes and conditions. Um, so the last part that I have is the kind of the conclusion to all of it. So I, I don't want to go into that part yet, but do you have any questions so far about what we've talked about? Acceptance, non-duality, any of it? Sorry, the difference between attachment and connection. Okay, the difference between attachment and connection. Um, I would explain it like this. Yeah, in order to live a fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's a dance. It's, um, and I think it makes sense when you think about a relationship because I'll be asked all the time when I talk about non-attachment, they're like, so what, am I, what does that mean about how I feel about my spouse or about my kids? Because there's this sense of attachment. Well, I explain it like this. So is this attachment? Would you say? No, is this attachment? See, I, I, to me, this is not attachment. Is this attachment? Yeah, that's attachment. So as we go through life, we're in this process of, of, of creation. Remember the do happening. There's the do happening. There's happening and doing, and they're both happening at the same time. And this is where the magic comes in, because you're thrown into this world where you're a creator. Everything that you do here has causes and conditions. This is the understanding. This is where karma becomes really exciting. Because when you understand that karma simply means action, now there's a sense of responsibility for everything that I say and do in life because it has causes. I, I, what I'm doing is a cause or a condition for something that's going to happen. And um, so attachment is, so Thich Nhat Hanh says that we need to love in a way that the person that we love feels free. That's non-attachment. It, it's allowing someone to be who they are. Loving them, being with them, going with them on the journey, all of that's non-attachment. The moment it becomes attachment is when we're controlling. And now we're saying this is how it needs to be, this is how you need to be in a relationship. But I think in life, it would be similar. Attachment is thinking, this is how life has to be. And I'm gonna try to force it this way. Versus I'm creating, I'm creating with life, the do happening, we're creating what comes next. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right. Um, so I think what I want to do next is we'll take a break, uh, maybe a 15 to 20 minute break. When we come back, I want to wrap it all up. Just a conclusion, closing thoughts, question and answer, stuff like that. Um, so be thinking if anything hasn't been uh, clear or you, you want me to explain a different topic about something, let me know and we'll do that in this last section. Um, but uh, that's all I have for now. So let's take a break now. <laughs>